Great. Well, uh, I'll I'll get us started. You you good with that, Leslie? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, good evening again. Um, for any of those I've not yet met, my name's Kirk Bishop. I'm a principal with Duncan Associates, one of two firms that's uh, been fortunate enough to be selected to uh, assist the town with the uh, update of the zoning and development related ordinances uh, of the town, a uh, project that we're referring to as Recode Topsum. Um, I'll uh, let my colleague Leslie introduce herself in a couple of minutes. Um, but tonight, Leslie and I um, are gonna provide you with a sense of what we've been up to since being retained to, to work on the Recode project. Specifically, we're gonna give you a sense of some emerging ideas and recommendations that we have for uh, the general direction that we want to pursue with the uh, code update project and to give you an overview of a report that we're working on um, that we call our project direction report. The project direction report includes several general recommendations about zoning and code issues that we think will need to be addressed as part of the recode project. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to give you a sense of that recommended preliminary direction, answer any questions you may have, and of course, we want to solicit your input on the overall project and any specific issues that you hope to you hope to be uh, hope to see addressed as part of the effort. I'll remind you at the outset about some of the general objectives of the Recode project, kind of reflecting back on the request for proposal that was issued that we responded to in order to secure this project um, and to give you some ideas for how we might approach um, new walkable mixed use zoning strategies in what we're referring to as the Topsom Center area, that kind of intentional growth area that's identified in the comprehensive plan. And to give you just a pretty high level overview of some general code improvements that we think could give the town a more modern tool set, user-friendly set of tools to guide future conservation and growth. So we laid out a four phase work plan for this project and we're now closing in on uh, the conclusion of our initial phase, we refer to as the discovery and, and diagnosis phase. Um, as we near completion of that initial phase of work, which has involved analysis of the comprehensive plan, of course, various city regulations, as well as spending a fair amount of time remotely getting to know existing development and building patterns within the town. We've supplemented that kind of office work with multiple conversations with town staff, uh, comprehensive plan implementation committee, and a series of, I believe, three small group listening sessions that we held with various users of, you know, frequent users of the code, um, various property owners, stakeholders, uh, civic interests and, um, and other interest groups in the town. The next major milestone that will really close out phase one, it will occur in October when we conduct a in-person uh, public, uh, public meeting to inform folks in general about the project and share our initial recommendations. That's currently scheduled to occur on October 6th. The second phase, the green on this plan is where um, this project gets really interesting as we um, will prepare an actual draft of new and updated code provisions. That work will kick off close on the heels of that October public meeting and will likely run through the second quarter of next year. And it is during that stage that we'll be working closely with our with our project advisors of the town staff and, and various boards and commissions, including CPIC and, and planning board and others. Um, and once we have a solid first draft, we would then initiate, um, we'd, we'd consolidate all the work that we've 
done over the months of October through, you know, the first or second quarter of next year. And we'll uh, prepare a public review draft that'll be the subject of a, of a very robust kind of public review and involvement um, as we share our, you know, public review draft of the updated code. The fourth and final phase of the project shown here is the formal adoption process, which of course will involve public hearings, additional public review, and ultimately uh, we're hopeful adoption at a town meeting, which we anticipate to occur in early 2024. So I mentioned this discovery or this directions report that we've been working on, which we'll share with you in the coming days, contains several sections. Um, the hey, first part of the report in is, is that okay to interrupt and ask a question? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, sorry. It's more just for purposes of how we do it. He, he mentioned public hearings. Are we going to have additional planning board workshops and go through our normal process of workshops and then have public hearings with the planning board with recommendations to the board of Yes, yeah, so there was a question about process in between the public hearings. Kirk and um, Typically, we hold many workshops with zoning prior to zoning the public. Sure, sure. So, um, the is, yes, we will be having multiple public workshops, much like tonight, uh, prior to getting to public work. Right. The consultants may not be at those many workshops. It's, it's review and input based on. Uh, can you hear me, Kurt? Yes, Kurt? I can. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 That's a tradition I'm sure that will continue. I'm just speaking in uh, very broad generalities about the overall process. Uh, we understand that you'll want to be comfortable understanding and having influence and, um, and, you know, getting your hands in the pie as we kind of finalize the, the draft. And that's certainly something that we would anticipate and, and look forward to, to joining you in to the extent possible. So this report, um, the first few sections just establish our sense of the overall policy framework that will guide the RECODA effort. That policy framework is largely derived from our review and understanding of the 2019 Comprehensive Plan, as well as our experience generally just assisting numerous local governments with these kind of code updates. Leslie's going to really tell you about the second part of the report, building types, the zones in the map, and that establishes a kind of preliminary framework for our sense of a solid approach to zoning for that Topsom Center area that I mentioned before, which again generally corresponds to the intentional growth area identified in the comprehensive plan. So I'll stress again, and I'll do it throughout this project. Um, that the recode effort is largely driven by a desire, a need really, to align the town's zoning and development regulations with that 2019 comprehensive plan and the specific targeted strategies that are focused around these nine big ideas from the comprehensive plan as, as shown on this slide. One of the big ideas, of course, is the, the plan's conservation, preservation and growth map which sets the stage really for a reimagined Topsom Center, um, a topic again that Leslie will be diving into in just a few moments in, and walking us through in just a few moments. Beyond that, beyond that map, one of the comprehensive plan's really prominent themes is its vision and call for a walkable mixed use development patterns um, and conversion of single use zones into mixed use zones, particularly in the Topsom Center area. Um, the recode effort also provides us with an opportunity to modernize the existing code to include um, what in planner speak is often referred to as form-based controls. And we believe that approach would really should really help realize the, the plan's vision for uh, the new Topsom Center area, make the regulations more predictable, and promote the desired physical character and design um, in those in, in the intentional growth area. For any of you unfamiliar with the term form-based code, 
it's really, again, just fancy planner speak for zoning that has a greatly increased focus on promoting building patterns um, and design elements that create a true sense of place um, with basic layout and design that reflects local, the local community and a walkable mixed use vision established in the plan. Form-based codes, again, it's just zoning, it, it, but it again focuses more on the physical form and character of the place um, in, a, in a kind of contrast to con what's often referred to as conventional zoning, which is largely what you have today, which focuses more on use and intensity of development, all important elements, but they sometimes um, lack the specificity and sort of local place-based approach that can establish the real vision. Conventional zoning tends to be heavily based on tax and numbers that give the appearance of um, uh, em empirical science, but are sometimes just abstract numbers as, as compared to form-based approaches, which really are, have more meaningful metrics in terms of situating buildings and parking and, and various site elements in a way that makes for um, walkable, really high character places that um, many of which already exist in the town, but are, aren't really driven by the conventional zoning you have. If you think about conventional zoning, what it often says is don't put the building closer to the lot line than this by way of setbacks, don't build taller than this. Um, and, a, and a number of proscriptions uh, that are expressed as kind of negative, don't do kinds of dictates. Form-based codes are much more prescriptive, giving a predictable and better sense of the, uh, the placement, location, and design of, of buildings that'll create a true sense of place. Conventional coding can be kind of unpredictable. It often needs to be supplemented with the types of site plan standards that you all work with on a regular basis um, and other sorts of tools beyond zoning, kind of negotiated case-by-case -case reviews because uh, form-based codes have a more predictable and meaningful metrics and numbers and standards associated with them. They can often lend themselves to a more efficient, um, faster kind of development review process. And that's, that's one of the many benefits to, to that side of coding. Um, we know that the updated zoning will need to address several other plan priorities, um, such as increasing the range of housing options for current and future residents, including including folks of various ages, income, income levels, lifestyles, and, uh, and, and other, other factors. We know we can also strive to do more in the RECODA effort to promote walking and bicycling, for example. Obviously, we need to ensure that our zoning policies support economic development, job growth, and those sorts of considerations, as well as an increased attention to issues of sustainability, resiliency, and even public health. And as you have an opportunity to review the report once it's distributed and when, once we get your input on what you're hearing tonight, um, you'll see several specific plan-based strategies beyond these big global comments that I'm making. Um, uh, you'll be able to see those and throughout the process, we welcome your feedback on and guidance on on these and, and other issues that we're going to want to address. Aside from the critical issue of aligning the code with the comprehensive plan, there are several other modernization and usability issues that can be tackled as part of the RECODE effort. These range from reorganization, uh, reformatting of code provisions, um, to updated site plan and design standards that again may enable a more efficient development review and approval process. One of the plans recommendations that I include here 
again, under other recommendations, is that of eliminating off-street parking requirements, something that the plan calls for um, under the big idea of uh, deliberate and intentional growth. It's worth mentioning here as, an again, an, a, an approach or a strategy that's recommended in the plan. I expect we'll have many more conversations about this as we actually get into the code drafting. But it's, a, uh, it's an approach that can have profound and positive uh, impacts on community appearance, as well as development economics and the, and the town's uh, fiscal health. As we move forward, we're likely to be proposing some new zones for public and civic type uses. We often recommend that as part of code updates sort of removing those uses from the standard residential and commercial classifications and giving them their own special classification so that the zoning map provides a greater indicator of where those types of uses are allowed now, where, they're, where they exist now, uses such as churches, schools, parks, and other civic and institutional uses. We'll also be, again, just to reiterate, um, tackling the site plan review standards and processes, um, uh, which you know are currently codified outside of the, uh, the zoning chapter of the code, but are an important part of the development review and approval process. Um, so with that, I, I, I know that I've talked at a very high level of, uh, to give you a sense of the idea of the changes currently being proposed, as you have an opportunity to review the directions report in greater detail, and certainly as we roll out actual initial drafts of new and revised code provisions, I think you'll get a far clearer sense of the types of general changes in approach that I've mentioned. And we welcome your partnership in um, making sure that we tailor those specifically to the needs and desires of the town. I'm gonna now hand the microphone to Leslie. She can introduce herself and begin exploring one of uh, our key project objectives that again, of creating high, high quality place-based uh, zoning for the Thompson Center area. Good evening, um, I'm glad to be here and um, I've been really diving into your community. And so I'm pretty excited to kind of show you where we're at. Um, as Kirk said, um, I'm going to be focusing on the Topsom Center coding specifically. And so this is uh, the map that was created by staff and included in the um, request for proposal services for this project. Um, so these are the limits of the area that um, I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, and as Kirk said, um, we're here to implement the comprehensive plan. Um, our regulations need to reflect the character and context of the community while still, oops, I'm getting a lot of feedback, right? While, um, let me see if I can turn down a little bit. While really um, addressing the potential growth of this particular area. Um, we believe that form-based regulations will provide, um, an ex it provides an excellent tool to do this. Um, but I understand that this is going to require quite a bit of back and forth and calibration of the code over these next few months. Um, while Kirk, let's see. Um, while Kirk talks uh, pretty broadly about what a form-based code is, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. Um, as he said, uh, physical form is the most important aspect of uh, a form-based code. It's not like we ignore use by no means do we ignore use, but what this does do is allow us to um, create sort of broader categories of use um, that can work within whatever physical form that we really define um, for the area. Um, what we'll do is use this physical form to kind of hang um, those physical characteristics off of the structure of this code with meaningful objective metrics standards um, for the aspects that we've identified as important to the community um, and building design so that we fit into that more rural uh, setting. 
Um, this system, as Kirk said, can provide much more predictable built form. And I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. And, and in addition to that, streamlined approvals. Um, one of the things that I really want to uh, kind of let you know about in advance is um, it's going to look a little bit different, even on the map. I mean, the code itself is going to look much different than what your current code looks like, but even our map could look different. The idea is that form-based codes being based very much so on the context and the geography of the place allow us to be much more specific to that place. We can um, map parcels, um, map blocks, um, so that we can kind of create that sort of fine grain approach to districts and nodes and neighborhoods. Um, the idea that you might have a different zone district on the end of a block than you might have in the middle of the block is simply because the end of the block provides other opportunities that the middle of the block may not. And so we can really think about how buildings can lay out on those parcels and define those pretty specifically, um, increasing developability, for example, on the ends of blocks than we might not have on the middle and so on. So this example of a map shows you quite a few zones, you know, even along a particular corridor. Um, and I just want to kind of prepare you for that um, opportunity. I keep losing. There we go. So when I say physical form being the structure, um, what I really like to use are building types. Um, and the idea that building types are something that the average person can kind of understand. Um, when we talk about storefront buildings, a lot of people will understand what we mean um, by, you know, your typical sort of main street storefronts. Um, when we talk about a kind of a village house, you can understand that we're talking about the form of a house. So building types can be a great way of talking about zoning um, in addition to sort of uh, providing for a higher level of predictability. So for example, um, what you see on this slide are four pages um, of regulations for one particular building type. Um, this one is a storefront building type in another place. Um, the images that you see on the left uh, convey the intent um, of that, that set of regulations. The two sort of pages in the middle provide tables and diagrams relaying very objective, um, very prescriptive metrics to achieve that building type in your community. And then additional information can be provided on other pages. And so the idea behind this is that um, we're noting where the building is intended to go um, on that parcel, um, how what the minimum and maximum height and kind of massing of that building will be. Um, and then additionally, one of the sort of key attributes of form-based codes is how they relate to the public realm, um, how you walk from building to building. Um, when you're driving down Main Street, what it feels like to look at the fronts of those buildings, how they sort of frame the space of any street, including Main Street. So that uh, relationship of the building to the public realm means that we have um, a series of regulations about where the entrance is, how much glass is on the front, and then further how we can define um, the scale of that building through a series of horizontal lines or divisions or vertical divisions to help draw you down that street. So we can incorporate a series of design regulations within these few pages that will meet the intent of that building type. That whole process means that, you know, there's a higher level of predictability, that the developer knows what the community is expecting, that the community will have a sense of what that building will look like um, before it's even designed, and that hopefully the approval process can be much quicker. So this idea of building types, sorry, I'm having trouble going between is you know, what I really wanna kind of talk to you about tonight. So I've spent a good deal of time, unfortunately I haven't been able to be there, but we're gonna be there soon, um, but trying to kind of understand the building forms of Topsom, especially Topsom Center. So understanding that, that sort of community feel, 
Um, and what I've created um, that you'll see in the directions report is a list of sort of proposed building types um, that I think will reflect the character of your community. So these are building types that may occur in your community, but also building types that I think we will need to implement the vision of the comprehensive plan in your community. So I'd like to kind of really quickly walk you through a list of those building types. Oops. There we go. Okay, so the first building type is what I'm calling the village shopfront building type. Um, this is the building, these images you can see are from um, that sort of intersection in the lower village um, at Main Street and Winter and Elm. Um, and this area is, uh, it's a sort of small node of shops that really provides a center of activity along the lower village, um, along Main Street and the lower village. Um, and I really believe that this building form is very specific to Thompson's character. It has a very kind of residential feel to it. There's a lot of space sort of between the buildings. Um, the buildings are smaller in scale, um, but they're still oriented to a pedestrian way. Um, the larger storefront windows on the ground story and the entrances uh, right on the street separates this building type from the second building type, which is the Village General Building. Um, the Village General Building is, um, has many characteristics of the shopfront building, but without that kind of ground uh, level storefront glass. Um, this building type really defines um, the Main Street Corridor and the Lower and Middle Village. Um, it is a building that can be used for both residential, it's obviously it's houses, um, but it also a lot of those houses have been converted to offices. So this is a, a really important building and indeed you can kind of see how the village shop front grew out of what I'm calling the village general. And by the way, these names, these terms are totally up for grabs. I'm trying to kind of um, give you some term that will help you to think of, you know, what we're sort of envisioning. So if you've got other ideas of what to call this, please um, be sure and let me know. Um, so we also have seen um, in the lower um, and middle villages, uh, new construction built um, out of these buildings. This is an example of new construction perhaps a little bit larger in scale than um, the rest of the village general buildings. And so we'll wanna kind of address that a little bit of a different roof style as well. Um, but you can also see, this is an example in Yarmouth that I found where um, these buildings can be clustered together around maybe a central square or a central green um, so that you can get a little bit more developability and create a little bit more synergy between the buildings. Um, create some sort of vibrancy and intensity of uses um, in nodes along the corridor. These sort of courts, what I'm calling a village general building court, could also be a village shopfront court um, where they're built around a sort of central area. And you've got some really deep parcels um, in the village areas that can accommodate this. So again, trying to kind of match that um, rural feel and scale um, but still getting some you know, good developability and, and intensity of activity and vibrancy in those areas. So um, in the mall area um, and kind of along Lewiston, um, we have what I call the storefront center building type. And these are not so specific to Topsom. Um, there's a lot of activity, a lot of new construction of chain stores and things like that. Um, these are pretty typical storefront buildings um, that are really single use, kind of single story buildings. Um, but recently we've seen some improvements to these kind of across the country um, where there is a lot more focus um, and orientation to sidewalks and outdoor seating and things like that. And definitely because of COVID, we've seen even more of that. Um, and in many cases, there's an improvement to sort of higher quality building materials and some sensitivities to building design. Um, there are lots of examples of these kinds of buildings across the country and what you can see here are 
some examples in other places where uh, this is a big box building that has some smaller stores that's been constructed in front of it that makes that big box a little bit more friendly um, to people kind of walking by. Um, this is a development that is, you know, essentially a shopping mall, um, but it has two uh, upper story offices um, and the streets through it are built more like main streets. So there are a lot of good examples around the country of how um, these kinds of places can be improved and be um, more friendly to pedestrians arriving to the place, um, as well as accommodating vehicular traffic. Um, you can see this example of a Starbucks that has a, you know, a nice patio in the front, but also has a drive-through in the back. More and more of these chain stores are developing um, kind of drive-throughs in the rear um, without interrupting that, that walkability at the front. So similarly, we have a general building. Um, the great examples of the Mill Island buildings um, that you have are, um, it's a sort of a, a typical building that can accommodate offices and, and residential uses as well as industrial uses indeed. You know, industrial uses used to occur in these kinds of buildings. Um, this building is gonna be really important um, in the upper village uh, areas in the, the north um, where you might have new forms of residential. Um, several of the images that you see here are from other places. Um, that accommodate um, a whole series of uh, residential building types. Like for example, in Connecticut, this is a six unit small apartment building. Um, this is a multifamily building, but if you notice it has entrances along the street. Um, so each one of those ground story units has an entrance, which just makes it more friendly along the street. Um, this is an eight unit apartment building that's built to kind of look like a house, a large house. Um, and then not only built out of um, siding, you know, wood materials, but also you can have um, some brick materials and um, create buildings that have a little bit more substance to them. Um, so this is a great building type for those kinds of um, affordable housing opportunities, um, but while still making them friendly um, within the community. Um, and then what we have next are sort of two versions of the general building. Um, the workshop building is similar, but allows for uh, uh, more industrial uses to occur um, with loading and garage entrances. You see several examples of craft breweries that also have some warehousing and distribution in them. Um, but if they're friendly to the street, then they can fit within um, the area. You see examples of uh, these kinds of older uh, industrial buildings that, that are similar in character. Um, so we can address those kinds of uses that are occurring already in Topsom Center that we want to keep um, maintaining, um, but still uh, allowing them to fit within the neighborhoods. And then again, another version of the general building is what we call a row building, which is um, typical in the Northeast. Um, with entrances, these are vertical units side by side, um, townhouses, row buildings, uh, live work units um, with ground floor higher levels of glass and other types of activities in that ground story can occur. Um, again, just another form um, that helps to create more of a mix of building types and also a mix of units um, within residential developments. Um, so I'm going to just kind of quickly touch on the last two. Uh, manufactured home site is something, this is a, a type of uh, residential that we um, believe can provide a lot of affordable housing. Um, what we want to do is develop a site type that will give um, some guidance to layout and creating more of a neighborhood feel um, out of these types of manufactured homes without so much um, on the focus on the building design. Um, and then lastly, the civic building type, which just to provide a lot of flexibility for civic and institutional uses, 
we typically include a more flexible building type that allows for churches and um, libraries and like your town hall, which is really kind of a general building, but could be um, used, a civic building could be used for more flexibility in design. You know, if you wanna have a Frank Gehry building in Topsom, this would be the building type that you would use <laughs> if you did. Um, the last uh, piece that I just wanna uh, bring to your attention is that I didn't really talk about the sort of more traditional storefront building because you don't really have any examples of those in Topsom. Um, this is an example from Brunswick, and you can see how the kind of village shopfront building fits within that sort of Main Street style. Um, you can also see from the comprehensive plan that those illustrations really use that more traditional storefront building, although there's some space between them and they're smaller in scale, they don't have that kind of continuous street wall that you see in Bath or in Brunswick. Um, but we probably want to consider allowing this as a building type and talk about where it might be most appropriate, you know, maybe around the town hall area on along Monument Place um, as a kind of a new building to introduce into the Topsom area, being sensitive to the scale of it um, for your community. I'd like to kind of get your feedback on that. I'm just going to very quickly talk two slides about uh, zones and mapping just to kind of give you a sense of what building types are for. What we would anticipate is this table that you see here on the left is um, an example of how we might distribute those building types um, amongst the different zones. Um, so those building types that I just went over are kind of arrayed across the top. And then I've sort of taken a first stab at identifying some new zone districts that you might have in Topsom. And you can see that each one of those zone districts would allow the different building types. And we can mix those building types in different districts as well, especially in kind of residential office flexible districts. Um, the other thing is we can have different scales of these zones. So for example, you'll see you know, two mixed use storefront zones, the mixed use storefront one being the smaller zone only allowing the village storefront whereas the two would allow the storefront center and might be used in the mall area. So we can have different scales that allow more of a variety of building types within them once we have a good sense of what those building types are. And then ultimately we would map those um, in all the different areas. What you'll see in the directions report once you get it is um, this table, as well as maps of each one of the areas um, within Topsom Center and kind of a first run at the map. Um, you'll notice here that I've identified um, this little node here at Winter and Main as something different from what's up and down the rest of Main Street in the lower village. And I think it's important to sort of preserve that node, maybe expand it, um, but still to identify it as something different than what's occurring up and down the rest of um, Main Street. And you can see that Mill Island is its own um, zone because it's a different intensity than what's up and down lower Main Street. So those kinds of tweaks and, and sensitivities that we can apply at a pretty fine grain scale on the map um, you'll sort of see a first run of with the directions report and, you know, we're going to push and pull that throughout that sort of phase two that Kirk was identifying. Um, and part of the reason why I do all of this at this stage of the game is because I want to dive in and get it in front of you so that we can have more time to kind of push and pull and talk about that as we're working through it. Um, you know, so just to kind of take you back to what I was talking about at the beginning, all of those building types that I just went over um, in sort of the next phase of writing the regulations, we would create a set of pages for each one of those building types with those images and a set of regulations that match, you know, that scale and those images um, so that it's pretty easy for a developer to come in and say, I'm going to build you a village shop front in this particular node and you say, here's the set of regulations associated with it. So it's you know, much more predictable and easier to um, implement it and ad administer as well.
that was a lot in a fairly short amount of time and I skipped over a bunch of stuff. So hopefully we can get some feedback. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leslie. You've heard us drawing on for quite a while. We want to certainly begin to take your feedback and continue this discussion um, as needed throughout the process. Just to remind you what's next up on our agenda beyond listening to your questions and comments about what you heard tonight is coming there in October and presenting some version of this project directions report that may be modified in response to what we hear tonight and the comments we get from staff. Um, and uh, you know, begin to roll out some of these ideas to the to the broader general public. So thanks for, thanks for your indulgence in letting us drone on. I want to open it up to any questions and comments that uh, the planning board or CPIC may have. Over your question. Can you hear us now? Yes. 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 <laughs> wow. Well, have a good evening. We're all set. <laughs> um, just the, the next step, um, we're going to receive this report, but I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be maybe some feedback questions. So um, your response in this report may be coming at what time should we expect that? He's asking us, I think. Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I'll come closer. So this is how we'll do this. Like, can you guys? So I'm, the, the uh, directions report will be delivered. If there's any revisions coming based on tonight's feedback, uh, would that be next week? Would that be a following week? When do we anticipate that? I I, I think uh, I think it's reasonable to expect it'll be next week. Okay. And I just wanted to mention that there is a lot of information verbally. Um, the report, we've seen a draft, uh, Andrew and I, and we wanted this to happen verbally tonight so that then they could have some feedback. But when you read the report, you you're get a better understanding of even what you heard tonight. We hope. <laughs> so questions, raise your hand and I'll try to facilitate or comments, questions, anything. I mean, general reaction. I think a general reaction would be good tonight. I know that, you know, personally, having dealt with conventional zoning in Thompson for 17 years, this is brand new. This is a big discussion for us all. Kurt, Kurt Newfeld, an engineer, has a question. Hi, folks. Thanks for this uh, presentation. I've heard a lot about form-based code. And it's still gelling. It's a sure. bit of a new paradigm. Um, my, my question or observation is that it all seems to have been very residential centric and a great deal of our work as uh, our business of civil engineers and, is commercial. And so I'm trying to figure out even how, you know, obviously I understand the building types, but if somebody were to bring forward a 3,500 square foot, 4,000 square foot, um, store for a neighborhood, particularly one that might have convenient uh, gas pumps or uh, a multi-tenant residential building, exactly how that, that fits in there. And the other thing that I see, or I don't see, I guess, in the, the, the layouts is higher density, but I don't see the provisions for parking for people who are gonna be operating a storefront and multiple customers and possibly offices upstairs or or residences at a higher level. So absolutely, 
parking will be a part of, you know, when we talk about building types, it's really kind of building and site types. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's really kind of building in site type. So it's it's building and then the layout of the parking is a part of it as well um, and where it would be located. Um, and we'll have lots of, I'm sure, lots and lots of discussions um, about that. But it definitely, um, it definitely is addressed um, the, the buildings that you were sort of referring to that sort of larger scale would probably be um, I'm trying to get there, um, would probably be, a, you know, either a ge general <clears throat> building for office or residential um, or this new storefront building that I am um, kind of proposing. Um, I'm trying to get there. It's not going. There we go. Oops. And, and, you know, again, what I'm trying to show is, you know, this, this type of development, um, I'm trying to show how we're kind of building it from the ground up based on the community, as opposed to just um, pulling something from somewhere else and dropping it into Topsum. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that answers your question or if that gets at, you know, what your concerns are. I mean, there would definitely be ways to push and pull the building types we may end up you know, I presented to you eight or nine building types. Um, we may combine some of those, we may add to it, um, but the clarity that can be um, given by having, you know, a certain number of building types makes the code easier to administer. It also makes it easier for it to fit with the types of development that are anticipated in the area. But I hope that you'll help us to understand that those, you know, anticipated buildings as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's Scott Libby. I'm on the planning board. Um, and thank you for putting this one up here. I, this kind of gets to some of what my question is. Um, you talked a lot about the lower village and middle village and showed a, a, a number of different building types. And I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out this form thing. Um, but it, it said, my sense is that um, we have that kind of incorporated some sense of form in our lower village and middle village, or mostly lower village, in, in that, you know, all, all your, a lot of your examples, whether it be the residential, they be the, the village storefront, the large, um, you know, Bowdoin Mill, the, the new mill, or new building, the priority building, et cetera, you know, we've got a mix of forms down there with a mix of uses that um, has, has come out of existing code. I don't know if that's just by accident, by happenstance, um, but you know, I, I like the idea of continuing to move that forward. The 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 traditional storefront building you bring up um, is is an interesting point, and I don't know how much you've looked at the previous comp plan, but we have zoning in place for the middle village or upper upper village. I guess that's where we are now. That try to incorporate this type of building in the zoning, whereby we put zero setbacks into the zoning. And that has resulted in something that was the antithesis of what the that con plan was looking for. It ended up with the Lee Toyota building, which has a zero setback right down the middle of the building in order to meet the code. So, you know, I, just one thing to keep in mind is we, you know, we try to go towards these forms and, but we, there's, you know, those, there's those tricks. Tell, you know, what happens with this zoning, how it's interpreted later on. Um, but this, you know, I, I hope this remains part of the set of forms that are included. It's obviously something that was in the comp plan um, and is something that could, you know, potentially uh, be of use up here. And certainly, you know, some of the other forms, the, uh, the, the brownstone, you know, row housing is, is also, you know, not something we have in, in Thompson. So, um, you know, they're, they're both uh, some pretty good ideas for, for denser residential, denser um, uh, commercial building. And potentially, you know, may, maybe we end up having some of that parking on the street. Uh, you know, there, there's room on Main Street. I live on Main Street. There's, we've got space down front for a sidewalk on my side of that, uh, you know, the, the road. 
space foot parking down there um, to make it more walkable. So I, I don't know if that's a question. I guess it's just a, a, statement. a statement. That's <laughs> very, very one. helpful. Yeah. So Larry, Larry, you had something? Yeah, I, uh, and maybe I'm missing what the entire thrust of what you're doing is, but are you focused <laughs> just on the on the village area or are you talking form based on uh, zoning uh, with regard to the entire town? Because I haven't heard anything other than just lower village, middle village, upper village, you know, all, village, right? village. Yeah, so, so the reason um, is, sorry, I'm trying to get to the map. Um, no, I am talking about I am talking about this project area. Um, so it includes the lower village, the, the middle village, the um, village center or the upper village, right. um, yeah. as well as this area to the north, as well as the mall area and park drive, as well as the MUC one on the other side of 295 that really doesn't, doesn't have much and the BP zoning on the other side of that. Um, the reason that you hear me talk so much about the lower village and the middle village um, is because I think that even reading the comprehensive plan, the value of that building form, it's the gateway into Topsom from that direction anyway, and it's got such wonderful character um, and great feel to it. And also you guys have um, helped to kind of craft a lot of the new building construction um, along Lewiston Road um, to sort of have some of the characteristics of the lower village. So I take that to say, you know, this is a big part of the rural character of Topsom. Um, and so I'm studying those building types and trying to kind of make sure that we understand um, how those buildings work together and what their scale is and what the characteristics and the materials and that kind of thing are. Okay, well, I, I, under, I understand all of that. I'm just trying to figure out uh, there's a lot more to top some than just that area. I, I can step in on this. Uh, a bit. The, the, we did this, um, the secret, we got in the secret to put an RFP out for the commercial zones in Thompson. That was the first, this is our first step as an implementation plan. It's a huge step. Thompson hasn't done anything like this in my tenure here to go through all of the commercial zones and address them in this manner. By doing so, you're right, it affects the entire code. So Kirk, Leslie's focused on a building type and form. Kirk is integrating it into the current zoning format. When you get the report, you'll understand the breadth of the zoning changes happening, meaning the whole format of the entire code. <clears throat> How we will address non-conforming uses, we'll address all of these items that are embedded in our code. We'll get rid of things that are currently redundant that we never use. Um, <clears throat> So this is a bigger project than just that outline. What this meeting really is focusing on tonight, instead of those ancillary pieces of the code that we're going to address, uh, and in some ways, uh, we will, um, based on our input, talk about the R3 zoning, the R2 zoning, the R1 zoning, but we're not proposing to introduce <coughs> form into those residents. Okay, but that yes. was, that's actually what I was wondering uh, is at, at this following point, up on Kurt's question, you know, as far as uh, what he was talking about for a commercial building, uh, you're talking maybe that is out beyond the, the village center, and are you talking form based zoning out? Well, let's say so the 196. That's a, that's a discussion we need to have. Okay. Um, we define this, I think what we will gain from this effort is the knowledge of if, if this continues to move forward in this format, first of all, as the town really does accept moving toward the form based versus the land piece space zoning form, uh, the format. So then the 196 court, hold on, the 196 corridor, we could borrow the building types and start placing those out along commercial corridors. I was that can be addressed and I think we can tap into the knowledge base from the consultants that some of the form that we're creating already will be a plug and play for those other areas. Okay. I, 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 
I don't have a crystal ball there. I'm just and, and to be clear that you know we have a general concept that we know that we need to update our code and we have specific goals that we want to do in order to implement our comprehensive plan. We don't know exactly what the solution is right now. You know, we're we're investigating this right now. What Kirk and Leslie are doing tonight are kind of sharing the first stab at the approach and seeing if this is scary or if this is something that's like oh easy peasy or you know we have specific questions that we need to understand more about from Kirk and Leslie. Um, we can form this as we want to as we go far. And as of now, Kirk and Leslie, could you clarify? And this is obviously something that we'll hash out over the next um, umpteen months, but um, procedurally, if, if the town goes to a pretty specific form base in certain areas, um, the role of the planning board becomes less relevant for getting a site plan permit. Don can watch his back skin. That's good. <laughs> well, don't, don't get us wrong. We're not trying to put you out of work. We think that some not worried about that. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> Some of the, because I know the pay is good. You don't want to lose that job. Um, <laughs> the, the concepts behind the form based approach um, that we're really thinking of, you know, piloting, I, I guess you could think, think about it in the Thompson Center area, I think lend themselves to a more, uh, to more administrative reviews those pages that Leslie showed with the standards for building placement and parking placement and the amount of glass on the front lend themselves to a kind of, does it comply or does it not um, kind of approach. And understanding that there are gonna be instances where people are gonna to continue to, to request or need a waiver and they might need to visit the planning board. But if a project is complies with the regulations, we see an opportunity for providing a much more efficient um, and faster approval process for those types of projects, because we're not forced to rely on, you'll have to admit, sometimes the language in the site plan standards and performance standards chapter is, requires some interpretation and case-by-case -case negotiation of what it means. The type of approach that we're thinking about for the Thompson Center area is, is not so much a bunch of words that mean different things to different people. It's we've can we've sort of through a process and experience kind of condensed those into you've heard us say meaningful metrics on a number of occasions. But it does portend a more efficient uh, process going forward for for projects that meet the standards. And and with regard to. Yes, as you can tell from this map, one of the kind of cool things about the comprehensive plan and particularly the conservation, preservation and growth map is it pretty clearly identifies areas of the town where change is anticipated or desired and areas of the town where stability and conservation and, and slow or no growth is the name of the game. Form-based code isn't so necessary where change isn't um, you know, again, anticipated or, or highly desired. So we think we can just work on some general improvements to standards and procedures and, uh, and, and regulations in the remainder of the town. Um, and again, sort of use the, the, the form-based approach in Thompson Center as a jumping off point for, uh, for the future. Dan's brewing on a comment or question. Yeah, I was just, just kind of trying to visualize this, these form-based or building type zoning districts, I guess is what you're gonna call them, right? Uh -huh. Do they function much like an, like an overlay district over, over our current zoning map or are we blowing that all up and starting over? Well, that'll that'll be a decision that we'll, we'll leave to you, but our recommendation for the specific study area is to replace the existing zones with uh, these with these new zones with the form-based elements in them. So they, they function as standalone zoning districts. They don't overlay existing conventional zoning, um, but rather just uh, are added to the template of districts in the code, replaced, 
a replace or or additive in, in nature. So that said, there may be some opportunities of of carrying forward some of the zones that currently exist. It's just that we may be rewriting them to fit into the system a little bit better. Um, so that we don't have to necessarily rezone everything. But we'll continue to talk about that. So Leslie and Kirk, uh, this is Susan Ray Reeves. I um, really got very excited as I'm hearing you both. Um, and I can't honestly tell you why. I'm just, I'm thinking that you're, you know, we've, we're, we're finally into the process of beginning to hear pieces of the vision of the possibilities, you know, and I really appreciated you showing the actual map of the area that you're going to focus. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of very different areas. And you're obviously going to take a very distinct approach to each one. And in some cases, as you described it block by block, you don't have blocks here, but that's all right. <laughs> we will. We will. All right. Um, but, and you know, there were things that you said that um, I just like the sound of them. When you talked about creating developability and synergy, clustering around a court as a possibility. Um, one of the things you talked about was making things friendly along the street. Yeah, people want that. Um, I have no clue what this manufactured home site type is, but affordability is really, really important here. And if that's what's gonna get that here and allow that to be possible, um, that sounds great. Um, I don't know, I think, I think part of what, you know, some of us, won't know how we feel about things until we start seeing the specifics. It's one of those things where I know what I like when I see it, right? And part of what I was thinking as you went through those slides is, wait a minute, that's not Topsum. But the question is, is it kind of what we want Topsum to be or not? Is it moving in that direction or not? And I think part of what we came away with in the process of creating this plan, which was adopted pretty unanimously by the town, so they want it, is the recognition that change is happening and it's really important for us to take a hand in directing it as a town because it's coming every week. Um, so part of, I think, my sense, you know, as a layperson, is sort of getting into some of the weeds of the areas that you're going to be giving us some, for instance, um, without all of the, I mean, it's helpful to see sort of the, the four pages, you know, for this building type, but I just, I'm going to look at the pictures, <laughs> you know, the planning board will look at all those specs, you know. Um, and, and to see what might be possible in different areas, because we're talking about the whole, or most of the Topsom Fair Mall, and a little bit up 201, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. So those are all very distinct areas, but they are areas where we're looking <clears throat> to be more intentional about growth. And it just, it feels very exciting. There's lots more in the directions report, um, and we really will look forward to your feedback on that. Um, you know, each one of the maps for each one of the areas and so on. But, but it is a totally new concept, and I think it's really important to, for you to hear about it. I, I, what we have found is that starting at this stage of the game, talking about it and presenting the pieces, you'll get more and more comfortable with it um, and have more and more conversations as we kind of move forward, um, which is, again, like part of the reason why I like to introduce 
all of this so so kind of early you know kirk is presenting the the front end is you know policy and broader goals and this is the direction that we're going this is taking it a little bit further than that um but we we just find that it's a lot easier for people to respond to something on paper that's real than just you know broad words so i look forward to your to your comments on the report. One other one. One other question for you. This may be getting too far into the weeds or too early in the process, but when I think about adoption in 2024 or if it drags on further, fair amount of time between now and then and preliminary rollout transition phase procedurally development that is initiated under the current code being in conflict with what is being proposed and how is is that a you know legitimate thing to consider or does that really just kind of work itself out as early rollouts and intentions are worked through in public form what do you mean uh, vic schultz we'll see yeah. vic it, it's it's a it's a very fair question. Our our typical approach is to include language near the front of the code that says if you filed an application or have received plan approval prior to the adoption or effective date of this new code, you are free to proceed apace with whatever was approved or whatever regulations were in effect at that time. Um, you could avail yourselves of the new code provisions, but um, not, we're not, we wouldn't not ever in my recollection, try and pull the rug out from under anybody who's, um, you know, has some vested interest or vested approval um, and, and need to come into compliance. And we would also, I think, be really mindful of the effect of anything approaching like non-conforming status for these buildings. We, we, we try and avoid that by including some fairly sophisticated language that doesn't hamstring property owners from making you know, reasonable improvements under old approvals or under old regulation. So, you know, sometimes that's good news for our clients who say, oh, well, we're concerned that there's going to be a bunch of stuff approved in the interim and we're not going to have anything to do with it. But we, but in our, in our experience, it's the fair and reasonable approach, um, particularly given the time frame for the project um, to, to try and hamstring development this, this far out, I, I don't think is, is fair. Um, so those sort of transitional rules would, would clarify that. Does that, does that make sense? You? Yes. Um, okay. Perfect. And until it's adopted by the town, the planning board is stuck with the uh, the current. Right. Keeping the plan in mind. <laughs> Keeping, of course. We're always trying to work towards implementation of the plan, right, Susan? Yeah. Um, and we completely understand that going to take a little time to get conversant with some of these new concepts. I'm very confident that um, as we as we roll out the ideas that light bulbs will go off and, and you'll find that this isn't as dramatic of change. You know, some of the elements that might be regulated in a reform based code are ex maybe expressed in different ways. Um, but in any case, we're not looking to you to give us carte blanche at this point in time. We just want to bring you along, have an opportunity to take you on a journey with us and, and show you in our initial drafts of the code the possibilities of this approach. And we'll, and we'll tailor them as need be to address you know, specific concerns that you may have. Other thoughts, questions, comments? We're just pulling the plug on Leslie and Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll know. Awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know everybody's getting ready to leave. <laughs>
you mentioned non-conforming uses, and of course you'll end up with non-conforming looking at what you uh, tentatively drawn, uh, Leslie. Uh, so how under the form-based zoning do you address <coughs> the non-conforming use and possible expansion of non-conforming use? Replacement of non-conforming use? This may be a to be continued kind of question there. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we can do it under to be continued, Kurt. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, but I just want to make the point that what we talked about tonight are, are building forms as kind of the, again, this general organizing principle. Nothing you heard tonight really suggests that we're uh, intending to really change the permitted use framework dramatically within the, the Topsom Center area. So what we might end up with at the end of the day are older buildings that don't comply with some of the building siding and facade details that, that we've begun to talk about tonight. But we, we will adapt the non-conforming provisions to you know, specifically address the extent to which you can expand those existing non-conforming buildings or existing non-conforming side elements. And it won't be dramatically different than the rules that apply today to non-conforming non situations, if you will. Um, I just wanted to interject before we all leave that, uh, you know, I'm hoping that everybody does have a, a million questions, concerns, comments, what have you. We know that they're not going to get answered tonight. We've spent a long time listening and chatting, but uh, this will be a continued group effort here, this joint workshop. As we get material to dig into and comment on, and guide these consultants to develop something that we are all one understanding, comfortable with, and that we believe you know is the right direction and what the folks in the community want to have uh, as we move forward. Um, I think when you get the report, this will become a bit more clear. Um, yeah, I probably should have said non-conforming form as opposed to use. Yeah, right. As far as yeah. I, I use the wrong terminology. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody here. Yeah, including the planners. Um, speak for yourself. <laughs> no, I seriously I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think it's a good discussion for the community to you know. Yeah. It'll be fun or something. Kirk and Leslie, are there any final words that need to happen? Not tonight. We look forward to you getting uh, the report and and uh, welcome all your input about missing building types, building types that you don't think really reflect the, the vision of the place and any other comments you have. And appreciate your patience, patience tonight. And I hope you'll stay with us for uh, the next next round of roll out and hope to see many of you uh in, in october hope you can join us at the public meeting and happy to discuss things in greater detail then um on, the, on that action item for all of us to receive the report and provide feedback will it be distributed to us in, in a format or a message that we were able to mark it up or is that something we're handling on our side how are we going to collaborate on yeah, especially when there's pictures it'll be really hard to annotate share feedback in a, I think we're gonna dispersed way. Maybe sharpen our red pencils on this one. I don't know about a digital. Kirk and Leslie, what are you thinking on how we're receiving that format was? Well, we have the capability to put that in a shared PDF style document that everyone can mark up and have access to comments that others are making if if that's the um, uh, you know if that's the approach we want to take. Um, uh, we, we we generally find that to be pretty useful. Give you yeah. a link to a document and it's posted there. Everybody's comments are visible. You can build on one another's thoughts. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, like, that. like that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't discussed this with, this with Leslie. I, I need to yep. talk to her about that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. 
But thank yeah, you. Thank Ron you very and much. Andrew, we'll, thank we'll you. talk about that. See what see what yeah. works best. But I think it'll I think it's an approach to work. Okay. Thank, thank you again, everyone. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thank Good you very night. much. See you again. Bye.